Subcommittee on Policing in 2017. No apologies for today's meeting have been received. Agenda item one today is governance of the SPA. Um, and it's an evidence session. Um, and can I welcome Andrew Flanagan, the Chair, and John Foley, Chief Executive of the Scottish Police Authority, to the meeting. I am going to invite Mr Flanagan to make a very brief opening statement. Thank you very much, Convener, uh, and I recognise that opening remarks are an exception, so I'd like to thank you for the courtesy. Uh, I would have preferred today that we were discussing matters of direction, sustainability and transformation in policing, uh, and the fact that we're not is in large part down to uh, myself, uh, and in particular my approach to two letters, one that I sent and one that I did not. Uh, can I deal first with my treatment of Moy Ali? Uh, I greatly regret the timing, tone and content of my initial letter to her. It was a misjudgment to send that letter uh, rather than open up a conversation and I bitterly regret that I was subsequently unable to allay her concerns so that she could continue as a board colleague. She was right in raising the substantive concerns she had about transparency and perception, and she did so in a manner that was entirely consistent with her role as a public board member. I was wrong, and it was important that to do it, I set the public record straight on that. I've now written to her and offered my full and unreserved apology. Second, let me turn to the letter I did not send, and that's namely the, uh, the one from HMICS uh, with his views on certain aspects of governance around committees and advanced papers. Having contacted the Chief Inspector to identify his concerns, I felt when I received his letter that it captured views already expressed rather than injecting views that were new, and those views had already been discussed openly with board members. I recognise that HMICS and indeed Audit Scotland are not simply stakeholders. I have now put in place an automatic process that every formal communication sent to me by them will be circulated to all board members unless otherwise stipulated by the sender. I have also instituted a review to ensure that there are no other such issues with any other letters that have not been circulated. I have therefore decided uh, as part of this uh, that I am keen to address any perception that the chair could be viewed as a gatekeeper on advice uh, to the board or that a board member might feel constrained in raising any issue of concern, concern directly with the chair. I have therefore decided that it would be useful, as envisaged in the legislation, that the SPA board look to appoint a deputy chair of the SPA at its next meeting, and we have initiated a process to identify nominees. An important consideration in that will be to have a gender balance across these two chairing uh, roles. Third, the underlying issue of public and private meetings. Uh, we sought to improve communications between Police Scotland and the Authority by having more discussions in private, but counterbalancing that by moving all decisions to the board meetings in public. In recent months, there have been significant improvements in the information supported to us. It is better presented and relationships have continued to improve and mature. So I believe that next week we can agree to adapt our approach. The board and its committees will meet in public while retaining the need to hold some items in private where necessary. Papers will be published well in advance of meetings and to everyone. As a new step, the public will get opportunities to contribute comments and questions for use in the public meetings, offering participation in SPA oversight, not just observation. And we will finally we will consider any further re recommendations on improving openness that come from the HMICS inspection due at the end of June. Finally, I have been considering my own position as chair. I have reflected very seriously on the views expressed by parliamentarians and other stakeholders. And in reflecting on the last two years, I believe that there is more that I have got right than I have got wrong on strategy, on financial clarity and control, on refreshed leadership for policing and on many other aspects. I acknowledge my recent mistakes and you have rightly taken, them to ta uh, taken me to task for them. But I hope to be judged also on the significant progress achieved and the leadership potential I can still offer. Policing is in a much better position than it was, but there is still a huge amount to do. I, do, I believe that now is not the time for yet another change of leadership in what will be a pivotal and challenging next three years for policing in Scotland. I have discussed this with my board and I have their unanimous support. I hope I can develop a broader con consensus in the coming months. 
Thank you, uh, Mr Flanagan, and we'll now move to questions, and I refer members to paper one, which is the note by the clerk, and paper two, which is a, a private paper. Um, can I just um, perhaps start, Mr Flanagan, um, by saying that I do appreciate your um, long overdue apology to Moy Ali, to this Parliament and to members of, of the SPA board. Um, and at your recent appearance, appearance at the Public Audit Committee, when asked whether you had apologised for your appalling, and I make no apology for using the word appalling treatment of Moy Ali, you said, and I quote, in my subsequent letter to Moy Ali, I expressed regret about the timing of my letter, which was caught up in the Christmas festive period. However, I have no regrets about making the challenge that I put to her. And that is a direct quote from you, from your appearance at the Audit Committee. So what has changed between that time and now? It was your judgment at that time that your actions were justified and you had nothing to apologise to Moy Ali for. I think uh, we had a difference of opinion. I think uh, that uh, I was uh, robust in terms of trying to defend my position, but uh, the uh, Public Audit uh, and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee have uh, written to the Cabinet Secretary. They've set out their views. Uh, I have to accept those views. I, I, I have to accept that I was wrong. Uh, and therefore, in, in my upbringing, and both in a human level, uh, also in a professional level, and as a grown-up, I think it's the appropriate thing to do to apologise and fully, and I have done that. Mm. But there is a, a difference, Mr Flanagan, between accepting you have done something wrong and believing you have done something wrong. That, that, that's a fair challenge, and I think that I, I do uh, reflect on this uh, very much. And I've looked back on the letters, and I've looked back on what's happened, and I have a, a, a deep and sincere uh, regret about how things unfolded, and, and I'm very sorry for it. OK. Um, in your opening statement, you said that you had the unanimous support of your board. For the record, have any board members called on you to consider your position? No, they haven't. No, they haven't. And you also you accept that you've made a number of mistakes recently. Um, <coughs> can you explain to the committee how you intend to make sure that those mistakes will not be repeated in the future? And do you accept that the SPA has suffered reputational damage that it may not recover from? I think, I think we can recover from it. I think there has been some damage there. Uh, I think that uh, my apology uh, to Moy is a start of that process. It's not the uh, end of a process. It's not drawing a line under it. I think that uh, the, the only uh, thing about uh, reputation I've, I've been referred to as bullying, uh, that's not an accusation I, I do accept. Uh, I have written a, a poorly uh, worded letter in haste, and I regret that deeply, but I don't think it amounts to bullying. I've had a very high-profile career at over 40 years. If I was a bully, that would have come to the fore long before uh, now, and I, I would reject that. However, I, I think that it is important for the public record that I said it straight, and I have done that. On the HMICS letter, I have instituted a, uh, a new procedure uh, where uh, letters will be automatically uh, circulated to uh, the board. And I've initiated, as I touched on in my review, a thorough uh, review going back to when I started with uh, the SPA to see whether there are any other instances uh, that uh, letters should have been copied and haven't. And the ongoing, as, as we move forward, as I said in my opening statement, these things will be uh, done automatically without me being seen as a gatekeeper. I think the important uh, one of the things in, in my uh, uh, statement is the idea of creating the deputy chair. I think that it is important. Uh, and I look back on this uh, uh, genuinely, and I think to myself, if I'd had a deputy chair that I could have discussed the matters with, uh, and uh, reflected on what I thought was the issue, uh, then that letter might not have been sent. Uh, it's also the case that a deputy chair, I think, can uh, provide a sounding board to me, and I think that's an important factor in this. And I think also, uh, as you see in other organisations, it's a conduit for other members. If they uh, are unhappy with me or anything that they have concerns about, they can address them uh, to the deputy chair. I'd hope that they would address them directly with me, but uh, you know, having a deputy chair, I think, is important. So in the things that I've got wrong, I think uh, we can rectify them. I think in openness and transparency, I've talked already about uh, changing the, uh, the committees in, in 
private back again to public committees as they were previously. Uh, I've also talked about uh, earlier publication of the papers uh, uh, and to all, uh, everyone, the public included, not just to key stakeholders. So I think in terms of those things, uh, I have actually uh, rectified them and going forward we should hopefully be able to restore any reputational issues uh, that we have. Uh, but as I said in my opening statement, I think when you look at where policing is today compared to where it was uh, 18 months or so ago when I joined, I think there have been significant improvements. Okay. And just for um, completeness, before I, I bring in other members of, of the committee, when did you write your letter to, to Moy Ali to um, apologise? I wrote it uh, Tuesday or so. Tuesday of this week, yes. two days ago? Yes. So you're, Okay. So she won't have re re responded yet? She may not even have got the letter? Uh, well, in anticipation because of the problems of uh, delays this morning, I also asked this morning that it would be emailed to her as well. So it's, it's in the post, but it's been emailed to her to make sure that she has it. So your, your appearance at committee today and your letter of Polly to Moy Ali, are those two things connected? No, I think uh, what's connected is the, uh, uh, the PAPL's uh, uh, report or letter to the Cabinet Secretary that was issued uh, last Friday. And that made me reflect on uh, where we were. Uh, I have put my version of events to, to them. They've listened to Moy Ali's version of events. They've found their conclusion is that they uh, uh, believe that she was right, and I have to accept that, and therefore it was a natural consequence that I should uh, uh, apologise in writing to Moy. OK, thank you. Stuart. Uh, <coughs> thank you, convener. Uh, I too, Mr Flanagan, uh, have had uh, up to December 2010, a 40-year career, uh, 41 career years it would be at that stage. I was then Transport Minister, and like you, I would claim uh, that there was more right uh, in what I had done as a Transport Minister over nearly four years than wrong. But ultimately, I made one mistake, and there was no one whose door it could be laid at but mine. That was clear. I took the view at that time, and uh, the First Minister accepted my view, that it wasn't necessarily about the individual, but about the danger of that mistake contaminating the future debate around the portfolio I held as Minister. Is there not a similar danger, notwithstanding your many qualities and your contrition in relation to the mistakes that you have made, that the mistakes you've made and your current position carry with it the very significant danger of contaminating and lying over the future work of the board. And in the light of that, do you think you should give further consideration to the appropriate arrangements in the board? Well, no, I, I've considered this very deeply, and uh, you know that uh, it's an uncomfortable place to be in terms of uh, the public calls for uh, resignation. And I've I've tried to look very uh, carefully and as objectively as I can as to the situation that we find ourselves in, and where we are in this uh, trajectory of trying to put Police Scotland and the SPA on a sounder footing. And I, I did it quite methodically uh, in terms of looking at where uh, policing was in uh, 2015 and where it is now. And if I may, I'd just like to go through some of those things. Uh, do forgive me, Mr Flanagan, I, I'm not in any sense seeking to undermine the achievements in office and the substantial progress that's been made in implementing uh, Police Scotland. I respect all of that. My fundamental point is quite a different one. It's not about your past or future capabilities. I'm going to accept what has been said on that. It is the very simple matter of that sometimes when a mistake is made, you can only remove that mistake from the future conduct of the area for which one is responsible by also then removing oneself and enabling a new holder of the office to take over with a clean sheet, not necessarily changing what's done beyond what's proposed, not necessarily doing anything different from what's proposed, but simply by removing the person who carried the responsibility for the mistakes that have been made, which you have properly acknowledged and which I welcome your acknowledgement of, I may say. And the biggest of people 
will always put the interests of the organisation of which they are part above their personal considerations should they be part of the decision making. And I simply invite you to take that same position that I took in 2010. I, I have, as I said, considered this carefully. Uh, policing is in a much better position than it was. We are at a pivotal moment. Uh, we are about to uh, sign off on a strategy for policing, the first that it will have had in its four years of existence. Um, I think that we've already had a change of leadership, uh, both in Police Scotland and in the SPA, and it would be more damaging uh, to the organisation and the future of policing to create a further hiatus by my departure. Stuart Stevenson um, very fairly set out the position, and, and, and I too welcome um, the, uh, the contrition in your, your opening uh, remarks, Mr Flanagan. But it would be interesting to, to know, you, with your reference to the, the uh, unanimous support of the board, um, was, the, was the question put to them, um, do you endorse my decision on the balance of, of, of all the issues that you've had to, to weigh up? Um, to stay on one that you support, or was the question put to them, um, do you believe um, that uh, my position remains tenable and do you want me to stay? Because those two questions are very different, particularly in light of, I think, some of the concerns that have been expressed about the way in which the, the, the board has operated to date. Well, I, I, I haven't put it in either of those terms. I, I've, I've said that um, it, uh, I've discussed with them the issue of the cause for my resignation. And uh, whether or not they would be happy uh, to uh, continue with me as their chair, and uh, they do believe uh, that on the balance of these things, they accept uh, that I have got things wrong. Uh, they uh, would prefer that that hadn't happened. Uh, they're happy with the changes that I've proposed, and uh, I, I'm uh, going to implement, or hopefully going to implement next week. Um, and in that context, they are happy with me to continue as their chair. And uh, during those discussions, I think one of the concerns was the extent to which other board members weren't necessarily um, uh, speaking up or whether they felt comfortable speaking up or whether they were in agreement with the approach that you were taking. During those discussions, did it emerge that there was a greater level of disquiet about what had happened and, and, and the way in which you'd handled it, albeit that they come to the same conclusion as you appear to have come to in relation to your own uh, personal position? Is that, is that something that, that emerged from those discussions? I, I, we, we obviously have discussed previously to uh, the, the, the Pavel's letter coming out, uh, the events of last December and how that's unfolded. In terms of uh, support for the changes that were uh, being made in terms of the private committees and the, uh, the publication of letters as part of a wider series of changes in terms of governance, uh, they were all content to uh, endorse that, uh, and they are still supportive of that, but are willing to, uh, in light of where we are now, uh, move back to the previous arrangements, and so therefore they are content with the actual uh, uh, substance of the process. Uh, you know, they have said to me, you know, you were a bit hasty and you were a bit heavy-handed in the, the letter that you wrote to, to Moy. Uh, yes, and I, and I would expect them to uh, say that to me frankly, and, they, and some of them have. And so, you know, I, uh, you know, I, I, I think one of the things that has been uh, a challenge in this one is that, in some way, that I have been characterised as a very dominant force on that board, uh, and that the members themselves are not as uh, forthright as they might be. Actually, I don't see that as a characterisation of, of the board. There are some very strong individuals on the board, uh, and when you look at their backgrounds and their experience and what they've done, uh, they have operated in a number of uh, uh, roles in public life at very serious and senior levels, and they are not shy about coming forward when they think something is wrong. Although it did appear in, in, in this instance, in, in, the, in the case relating to the Moyali's uh, treatment, that they were reticent for whatever uh, reason. I mean, you yourself have 
have, um, in explaining the rationale for the, the establishment of a new deputy chair post, suggested this gives an, uh, an option as to who um, board members might wish to approach about um, a, a given issue. But that does seem to suggest that the, there was a reticence, notwithstanding what you've said about the characters of those on the on the board. I, I think that's about the handling, not about the issues of the, uh, the governance changes themselves or the board meeting back in December when this happened. I think they, they understood that. Many of them were as surprised as I was when uh, Moy uh, uh, dissented uh, at the meeting because that had not been our understanding going into it. What they have reticence about is then how I handled it afterwards in terms of, uh, as I said, being too hasty and, uh, and over, uh, you know, over, overly heavily handed in it. Liam, did you, uh, sorry, John, did you have a supplementary on this? I, I did. Um, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, <coughs> panel. Yes, um, it was to, to follow up on, on the issue that Mr Stevenson raised, Mr Flanagan, and it's a question about judgment because uh, the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee heard from Moy Ali, uh, and if I read an, an extract, Andrew Flanagan told the committee that dissent is OK but his letter to me talked about how sharing public disagreement was a resigning matter. Can you s express how, if, if that's accurate, whether you, why you would consider that a, a, res a resignation matter, but something much more profound than that that has brought questions as to the effectiveness um, of the organisation you chair isn't a resignation matter? Well, f firstly, I, I think that uh, dissenting in uh, public in that way is a very serious issue that you need to, as a board member, consider very carefully before you do it. And in fact, it's a resignation issue. Uh, it, I actually didn't ask her to resign, and I and I, I've, I've clarified my remarks in my second letter to her, uh, which was sent to her uh, early in the new year. So I. I you know, I, I said to her, in many cases when people uh, have disagreed with a board, they will come to that conclusion themselves. And that's what I said in my first letter. It's a matter for Moy herself, not a matter for me as the chair. Because dissenting in public is an absolutely, entirely fundamental right of a board member. And so you didn't suggest that it was a resignation issue? No. I said it's a matter for her. If, if the issue is so big that she cannot live with the decision that the board is making, then it becomes a matter for you as an individual board member whether or not you wish to continue and support that, that uh, decision or whether or not you consider it a resigning issue. And that's what I said in my original letter to you. And therefore, is it your position that your um, hasty and overly heavy-handed, or whatever the phrase you used, position isn't one that would cause you to reflect? Well, as I said, I, I, before Moy decided to resign, I sent a second letter to her in which I explained more carefully and thoroughly the position, and I uh, explained that dissenting in public was not uh, uh, an issue that I felt that was a resigning matter. In fact, I think it's a, it's a right of every board member, as I've said uh, already. I think the issue, uh, the fundamental issue at the board meeting was that her uh, decision to dissent uh, was a surprise to me. That was, that was what uh, the main frustration was. As a chair <coughs> of a large organisation, uh, you try to manage these things, that there's an open dialogue, there's an open communication uh, between board members, uh, so that that kind of a surprise wouldn't arise. Is that a failure on your part, then, that, that you found it a surprise? You, you, not, one has to reflect on both parties in terms of uh, how that happens and uh, in, a, in a, a dialogue with members uh, and other members present, uh, you would have expected to understand that. As I said, you know, it, it's, it's not a decision that should be taken lightly and therefore you would expect everybody around the table to understand that that was what your position was. What would you think would constitute a resignation issue for you, Mr Flanagan? I, I, uh, I don't know, but clearly uh, it would be speculative, but uh, many people have had to resign over, I don't know, uh, issues in terms of uh, major fault in computer programs, for example, or uh, major uh, issues around, uh, uh, you know, whether or not they have, uh, I don't know, taken uh, uh, gifts or whatever, things like that, that would be, uh, that would be an issue. But, but, but as a senior important public figure, judgment is all important. I, I think judgment is important, and we, we make judgments all the time. And if, if every time you get something wrong, then you have to resign, then the ultimate thing is that uh, you, you, 
A, you will not learn from that. You will not get the benefit of those things to come back and, and to reflect on. You will not be a better individual and a better leader in those circumstances. And if, uh, if, if the performance standard is that you cannot make any mistake of judgment, that's a very, very high uh, um, standard uh, for us all to aspire to. No, I, I would agree with you, but you would, you would also acknowledge that there must come a tipping point if the individual becomes the story and therefore a distraction from the core function, the important public function of scrutinising a vital public service. Yes, but I think, as I said earlier in my opening statement, you have to take this in the round of what I have achieved and where I've made this mistake. I have further questions, but I presume you'll, you'll want to Could bring in other just, members. Just Thank before I, I, I bring um, Rona in, um, one of, one of the, the, the tasks that, that was, was given to you was to improve the governance, the openness, the accountability of the SPA. Is that correct? That's right. I was yeah. asked uh, when I was appointed to conduct the governance review itself. Uh -huh. to, to improve openness and accountability. So it would seem to me, and I'm, I'm sure if you don't think I'm correct, you can, you can correct me, that one way to improve openness and accountability would be to hold meetings in public and to also allow dissent. Because if, you, if, you're, if you're promoting um, a, a situation where you have healthy discussion and disagreement, what is wrong with dissenting in public? I, I, I genuinely don't understand why you have an issue with someone dissenting in public at a meeting, when one of your tasks was to improve the openness and accountability of the board that you chair. Well, first let, let me say that the governance review itself had some 30 recommendations in mm -hmm. it, uh, 28 of which uh, yeah. were uh, uh, uncontroversial and have actually uh, substantially improved the, uh, uh, both the local engagement, which was the primary driver of the governance review in, in mm -hmm. the first place, and also uh, meant that uh, we were able to increase the scheduled number of board meetings that we would have in public. Those, uh, those board meetings are live streamed, and as I said, we've increased the numbers of them. Uh, the challenge for me in terms of the <coughs> committees was that the committees themselves were getting bogged down in extraneous detail. Uh, there was a, a, an inadequate flow of information from Police Scotland to the committees. Uh, there was reticence uh, to provide more uh, simpler papers and also uh, uh, be clearer about the issues and also to let the committees get involved in thinking at an earlier stage rather than just uh, when a final decision had been made by Police Scotland. So the, the concept of taking the meetings in private was essentially to create a little more uh, safe space, as it were, for the discussions between the authority and Police Scotland. But as a consequence of that, I was unhappy that the committees themselves should then have the power to make decisions, because that would have been wrong if those decisions had been made in private. So another recommendation within the governance review is that all decision-making powers of the committees were removed and placed into uh, the public board meetings. So now all board meetings, uh, all decisions are made in public. In terms of dissent, I, I, as I said, I have no issue with uh, anyone uh, uh, dissenting, and I made that clear in my second letter to uh, Moy Ali. Even, I mean, your letter dated the 19th of December to Moy Ali says, on a professional level, in my experience, individual board members who wish to share public disagreement would normally consider resigning due to their view of the seriousness of this issue. Yes, and, and I think that is consistent with on board. I think on board says uh, that it uh, is at some point that you have to consider that issue. If your disagreement is so substantial and so uh, that, that that's the step that you want to take, it's perfectly within your rights to do so, uh, but that it, you need to consider whether or not you can live with that decision uh, on an ongoing basis. Okay. Okay. Rona. Thank, thank you, Convener. Um, Mr Flanagan, your opening statement um, represents a complete turnaround of the ethos of your stewardship as chair of the SPA. How do you expect the public to have confidence that you'll be able that you will carry out everything you, you've said you will? And why has it taken 18 months for you to have this sort of conversion in the way that you you're going to operate? 
I, I'm not sure that it is uh, a, a conversion on, on, on my part. Uh, as I, you know, I was asked to do the governance review. I put that out into the public uh, uh, in um, March 2016. I set out clearly what the recommendations were. Uh, I, because of the election at that time, it was some uh, some weeks before uh, Scottish government came back and said that there was the recommendations had been accepted, and then we set about uh, implementing them. During that period, uh, what, I, what I think uh, happened was that there was a significant change in the relationship between the SPA and Police Scotland that became much more uh, open. Uh, it was, it was uh, I would say, a, a proper relationship. It's robust when it needs to be robust. But it was developing, the information flows uh, were improving all the time. And actually, when I look at it now, uh, the necessity or the, or the idea of having the committees in private is no longer necessary. That's, that, that, that's the view, and I think that we can uh, move on from that. Um, so I, I don't think in that sense there is a, a, a change. It's that, that we're in a, a situation that has been moving forward. Uh, there's much improved dialogue between ourselves and Police Scotland, and therefore I think that we can uh, move on from this and, and move back to what was there previously. What worries me is that your natural instinct was not to be transparent, to hold things in private, and to carry out in that manner until it, it reached a tipping point. And that's why I think the public might be worried. I, th I think if you take that issue in isolation about the, uh, the private um, committees, uh, you, you could take that view. Uh, but I think it would sit inconsistently with the idea of having more public meetings to having papers that are simpler, clearer, uh, consider the options and people can understand them uh, more easily. And that all decision making is removed from the committees and uh, made by the, the full board in public session, live streamed on the internet. So I, I, I'm not sure that I accept the characterisation of this in isolation, that this says that I like to do things in, in secret. I, I actually don't. I'm quite happy and content to do things in a public setting. Okay, thank Did you, you have a, a supplementary on that? Yes. Rona McKay's um, line of questioning there. I, I, I accept what you're saying in terms of um, your, your, your default position, but what you alluded to there was the difficult relationship between Police Scotland and, and SPA at the time, and perhaps providing a safe space for, for discussion to take place. And I think all of us would accept there are going to be certain discussions that will need to happen um, in, in private. But I think any suggestion, notwithstanding the, the improved relationship that may be there, that Police Scotland is any way out of the woods yet in terms of the, the difficult decisions that, that lie ahead, that the concern would be that there will be a reversal back into to holding more of those discussions in private going, uh, going forward whenever they're difficult. And, and areas of dissension, you, you almost need to have um, more visibility of at, at, at points where it isn't clear cut what the right approach ought to be. That that dissension is needed more um, at a point where there maybe are those tensions. Um, I, I, so that would be my concern from what you've just said. I, 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 I think there are always concerns and there are always issues around when is the appropriate time to make things public. Uh, and, and I t tend to see it on a kind of a a spectrum that it's not, one should assume that it's always going to be public at some point. And it's the question is, is along that spectrum, when is the right time to put it out into uh, the public domain? I think that the concern that I had when I started was that the SPA was finding out about things at the 11th hour, the very last minute, uh, that had already, if in effect, been decided within Police Scotland. And, and in terms of our role of governance, we needed to be engaged at an earlier stage, to be more proactive in the early thinking of that, so that we weren't really presented with a fait accompli. Uh, and, and this was an attempt to try to create that uh, environment where uh, Police Scotland would feel more comfortable about sharing information at an earlier stage. It wasn't about those decisions then, then being decided then, and as evidenced by the, the fact that the committees have no decision-making powers. It was then about how, how do you follow that process up to the point that it then does come into the public 
board meeting and that people can hear how the thinking has been done and what has been uh, the, uh, the options that we have and what is the correct decision that we need to make at that time. But, it, but in the sense the trigger shouldn't be the difficulty of the decision or, or, or the extent to which there may be dissent and disagreement um, within, the, uh, within the committee or indeed within the board. Um, that wouldn't strike me as a terribly sensible principle because all that's going to happen is some point down the, the line when further difficult decisions are going to be taken that there's a reversal back to a, a situation which we've all agreed was was not helpful or healthy. And, and, I, and I think that relies on the, the people on both sides uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen. And I think that we have developed a strong and robust relationship uh, and we have built the trust and confidence and respect uh, uh, of Police Scotland uh, that they can work effectively with us. So I think we're in a much, much better place uh, now than we were when those recommendations were written. If I can sum up your um, opening statement, and thank you for an advanced copy of it, Mr Flanagan, then it's fair to say there's contrition about two letters, the initial re letter that you wrote to Moya Ali, and um, how you dealt with the letter to you from Mr Derek Penman. And thereafter, there are various things in your letter that I presume you have written to try and give the committee some comfort that you are now on top of this or to explain that there were very good reasons for what you did. Is that the case? No, not really. I, I think uh, I already, so on, on the letter from Derek, uh, sorry, Mr Penman, uh, I, I already had said to uh, the Public Audit Committee that I, uh, in hindsight, uh, wish that that letter had been circulated to the board. So, no, I, I, I have no uh, attempt here to uh, try to defend that sort of position. I think I've accepted the conclusions of... Uh, I'm, I'm puzzled. Are you contrite that you didn't um, send a letter and circulate it to the board or not? Yes, I am. I'm, right. I'm sorry. Well, that's what I, I said I, in my I, initial letter. I, I, I'm sorry that that, uh, that didn't happen. I, I think uh, I, I looked at the letter. I thought that the issues that he had raised were already um, uh, had been discussed. Uh, if I go back to the sequence of events, uh, we'd had a, a members meeting at which uh, a number Can of... Can I stop you there, perhaps? I read that very carefully too. This is the HMI inspector of constabulary. And I'm rather puzzled and somewhat alarmed that you then go on to state that I recognise, it's like a, a light bulb moment, that the HMI CS and indeed Audit Scotland are not simply stakeholders. Mr Flanagan, you are the chair of the SPA and it's taken you 18 months to realise no, I, I, I do realise that. I realise that from the outset. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that it's a sudden moment of uh, recognition, but it's, it's to say that uh, perhaps in terms of that letter coming in, uh, I, it should have been circulated as a matter of course, and it, it, it wasn't, and I've now instituted a procedure to ensure that that is the case. But I think that's the difficulty we have. It was from HMI, Inspector of Constabulary, any reasonable person would have expected that to be shared with the board. Can I move on to another aspect of that letter? It would be good to receive some clarification if um, Mr Foley, who's been sitting very quietly there, but who features quite considerably in a lot of the events which happened, did he or did he not receive that letter and see that letter from Mr Penman? Uh, yes, uh, Mrs Mitchell. I. Uh gave evidence to the uh, the papal a few weeks ago um, and in that evidence uh, I said that I did not recall seeing the letter at the time it was issued. I advised the committee that I might have seen a copy of it and it might have been sent to me via email but I did not recall it. I also said that I did not see a, a, an original letter which was presented on the day which was addressed to Andrew Flanagan um, and that was my position. Subsequent to that uh, that meeting, uh, there was a second uh, meeting of the committee uh, in which uh, it was uh, suggested that it had been uh, indeed sent to me. I checked uh, my email inbox uh, to verify that and it was indeed uh, sent to me. Uh, I didn't see it at that point in time as far as I recall. Uh, I was actually out of the country when it was sent. Uh, I can't access emails when I'm out of the country because we are not allowed to take our police devices abroad uh, for security reasons. 
I also have a process in my office where letters such as this are taken out of the email folder and put into an electronic file. It's just called the mail file. Uh, and I've been able to establish that that wasn't done. Uh, that was, uh, in my view, down to human error, a staff error. And I don't criticise my staff uh, for uh, human errors. It's my responsibility uh, completely. Uh, subsequent to that, I also checked my diary uh, on my return uh, from uh, being abroad, so this is me checking it last week, uh, and I had a very full week that week in relation to meetings, etc., and I would have had little time uh, to deal with administrative matters, so that's actually what happened. It's an unusual circumstance, uh, and it's the first time, personally, I can recall uh, a letter such as that not finding its way into the mail file. Well, we can all miss the emails, Mr Foley, but Mr Flanagan, was that letter never discussed with your Chief Executive? Yes, he was. Uh, if, I, if I go back to the series of events, uh, on the 5th of December we had a members meeting at which a number of the members themselves had spoken with Mr Penman and had uh, understood that he had concerns about uh, the governance changes. Um, we discussed these fully uh, at, at that meeting and one of the members, uh, George Graham, who is a former uh, Chief Inspector, uh, said that he would uh, uh, have a further conversation with Mr Penman. Can On I maybe stop you there? No, I'm more, I'm more I, I, interested in your relationship because we're looking at the governments of SBA and just right now it's not looking too hot. So have you um, discussed it or did you take the, um, the opportunity to dis discuss it with Mr Foley individually? He is the chief executive. You've already said that it might help if you are the deputy chair. Hey, we could even have he gender balance and you would have had someone to, to talk to about this. If I put it to you that perhaps Moy Ali would make or would have made an excellent um, chair because she seems to have picked up everything that was fundamentally wrong, I don't altogether have confidence that her concerns would have been greeted from your initial letter and your reaction to her with um, the, the kind of um, panacea that you think is, is now going to, to sort the, the arrangements that you put in place. In other words, your, your initial reaction would have been just as volatile to your deputy chief, um, deputy um, chair had it been Moya Ali voicing what we're now everyone recognises as legitimate and um, the concerns that we would want a conscientious board member to raise. If we can go back to your, your first question as to uh, was Mr Foley aware of it and did I discuss it? Um, the letter, uh, as I was explaining, uh, we'd had the, dis the meeting and the discussion at the members' meeting on the 5th of December. Mr Foley was present at that meeting, if I recall correctly. Um, uh, George Graham had, had suggested that he would talk to, to Derek Penman. By the Friday, uh, Friday the 9th, uh, I had not received any communication from uh, Mr Penman. And I sent him an email that afternoon saying, I understand you have concerns, these have been raised with a number of members, uh, could we meet to discuss that? I received by return the letter that uh, you, uh, you have seen a copy of. Um, however, that was late on a Friday and I was, uh, in the first few days of the following week, I was not working on SPA business. I have other organisations I work for as well. The first time I was back in the office was uh, the day of the board meeting. And in terms of the pre-discussion that I had with the board, uh, I, I raised the issue of Derek's letter. My view was, as he asked in the letter, was that uh, I inform the board members of its contents. I did that. They were consistent with the, the concerns that had been raised with them previously. And in the event, it didn't actually get copied because we were then into the board meeting itself. So it never occurred to either of you to actually formally issue it to board at that point, despite it coming from HMIC, HCS, uh, who, uh, who you're accountable to, who, who has an oversight from you, and who you say you fully realise that that is their role right from the moment you were appointed. Yes, I, I, as I uh, said, the, uh, the, the letter was discussed in some detail and uh, the contents of it uh, were consistent with uh, conversations that individual members had had with Mr Penman previously. Uh, so it was discussed and the letter asked me to make sure that the board was informed of his views and I complied with that. They were informed of his views. Yeah. Um, Moya Ali has also made it quite clear that um, her views are well known. 
it was well known in the board. So I think it's quite reasonable to say she really left with no choice than she was met with such um, such intransigence from yourself to to go public because her vo her views were well known. They weren't being looked at, and her views also included um, the CE chief executive ignoring. Um, government guidance and stakeholders' concern. How have you addressed that? I'm not. I'm, I'm not clear about the reference to the chief executive, but the uh, in terms of Moyes. Moyes. Well, I, I'll give you exactly where it was. It was when Miss Ali was um, giving evidence. I will summarise the position of few points: the decision on private committees at the last minute and the last publication of papers. Another issue was contrary to statute and against the spirit of public service and accountability. The board and the chief executive ignored government guidance and stakeholders' concern. The chair was wrong to try and suppress information and debate and in punishing me for taking a principled stance in public that was consistent with my well-known private view. How have you addressed the chief executive, the, the challenge about the chief executive ignoring government guidance and stakeholders' concern. Uh, How have you addressed it, Mr. Uh, well, to date, I haven't addressed it, uh, but I, I, I'd let uh, Mr. Foley speak for himself. Yeah, uh, thanks, uh, Andrew. Uh, Mrs. Mitchell, I, I uh, was made well aware of Moy's uh, views, and, and I've said uh, publicly at the, uh, the PAPO uh, committee, uh, and, and, and I, I think it uh, in other public fora as well, uh, that we had a, a reference group uh, for the governance review. And Moy and others uh, were part of that reference group. And I absolutely state, again, categorically, that Moy consistently uh, made her concerns known uh, over the course of that, that period. Um, and she, she continued to do so uh, as a board member in discussions. And some of that is clear in uh, some of the information that I sent over uh, to uh, the Public Audit uh, Committee last week. Uh, so Moy's views were known. Uh, she made uh, them known to me. Uh, up until the point of uh, resignation uh, as well. It was me that Moy came to speak to the day before she resigned uh, to advise me that that was the course she was taking because I had offered to uh, assist her in any way uh, that I could with um, her concerns at that point in time. And what uh, did you um, think you could do? I mean, it was quite clear what her concerns were. Where these well, issues should not have been discussed in private. Well, <laughs> To answer your point of what, what did I think she could do, uh, at that point in time, uh, Moy had uh, came to see me uh, privately and we'd spoken on the telephone about uh, the letters which, which you have in, in front of you. And uh, I, uh, in an effort to uh, resolve uh, the situation uh, for Moy, uh, suggested that she seek uh, a meeting with the chair uh, to uh, see if the differences could be, uh, you know, perhaps uh, smoothed over and uh, a compromise position could be reached. And I said that if uh, she still felt dissatisfied after that process, uh, she should come back to me and I would uh, look to uh, effectively mediate and trying to form it, a, a solution. It seems to me, Mr Foy, you're saying, um, we've got a slight distance of opinion here, two members aren't agreeing, you're totally ignoring the very serious substance of her concerns and where she kept voicing it, that these meetings should not be held in, in private. You should be transparent and accountable. And in your letter, um, you said, Mr Flanagan, that, or you've now said that you were always on the back foot, so these private meetings were a, a, an opportunity to get out there, have these frank discussions. But anyone who's looked at the issues that have come up during the, the short life of Police Scotland will know that the vast majority of them have come from the SPF, and you totally ignored and banned them totally from these meetings. We'd have no consultation with them or the unions. The very people who were in their position to alert you to the kind of things the SBA had been continually on the back foot with. There is frequent engagement with the, the SPF, and in fact, uh, you know, within the committee structure that was set up, 
Uh, it wasn't that uh, people couldn't come and give evidence in the way that we are doing today, and that the SPF and other uh, uh, staff associations and unions would be able to come to those meetings, and in fact some of that has happened. So there is always a, a route for that engagement to take place. Were you aware that they were unhappy, they hadn't been sufficiently consulted? Uh, w yes, because there are ongoing discussions with uh, with the um, with all of the, uh, the the stakeholders in the in the organisation, and we, uh, you know, the view was let's try this, let's keep it under constant review. We when we agreed the the changes to governance, we said we would uh, do it for six months, and then we would review it, and we would take into account the views of stakeholders as well as the but evidence that But do you recognise a lot of the issues have come from the SPA, so therefore your argument that you know we were having um, meetings with Police Scotland to try and get up to speed, Police Scotland then really are fundamentally flawed. Do you recognise that? I, I, I don't agree with the characterisation that it's fundamentally flawed. I think there are, were a number of uh, avenues that uh, existed for uh, dialogue with all the, uh, the stakeholders and the SPF, uh, you know, I've met with them, with them on several occasions uh, and there were regular meetings that were set up and as I say, they could participate in the, uh, in the committee meetings and have done so since December. You may have confidence in, in what you've done so far, Mr. Flo uh, Mr. Foley and Mr. Flanagan. You haven't filled me with confidence today. Um, just before I bring in um, Ben, um, Mr. Foley, I wanted to, to come back to the, the issue of, the, of Mr. Penman's letter. On the 20th of April, you appeared at the Audit Committee and you were asked um, several times if you had seen the letter. Um, and you said you may have seen it, but you don't recall it. Um, you were then asked a question um, around, it's a very important letter, you either saw it or you didn't before the board meeting. And your response to that question was, mm. I am telling you that I do not recall seeing it. I mm. recall having conversations with Mr Penman around yes. that time mm. and him expressing his views to me clearly. Yes. Having seen the letter and read it in recent days, I find it as in accord with the conversations I had at the time in which Mr Penman expressed his views. So clearly you had discussions with Mr Penman, yes. the Chief Inspector, um, who raised his concerns with you. This was, I, I presume, immediately prior to a board or the week before the board? It, it, it was over a, a longer period, convener. Um, Mr Penman so, and I are in regular contact uh, and uh, I knew that that was Mr Penman's view for a while. So he expressed his, he raised concerns, quite grave yes. concerns, w with you. Uh, did you, um, after those conversations with Mr Penman, um, think it was incumbent upon you to share Mr Penman's views with Mr Flanagan? Yeah, yes, I did, and other so, board members. So you, sh you shared the views? Yes, absolutely. So, given that you've had a series of conversations with the inspector, who has expressed serious concerns about the board, and he follows it up with a letter, and you don't really recall seeing it? Is that not something you would watch <coughs> coming in? Well, I think, uh, convener, my explanation earlier uh, perhaps satisfies that. Uh, no, actually, Mr Foley, it doesn't. Well, well, I did give you an explanation, convener, and it is an honest explanation. Uh, the, I don't recall seeing the letter at the time, and I've given the reasons why. Uh, I believe that I absolutely didn't see the letter at the time. Uh, I was aware of, of Derek's views and I had passed them on. Hmm. So the, the inspector raises very, very serious and grave concerns. Did he at any point say to you, I'll follow this up in a letter? I don't recall uh, discussing the letter with Mr Penman, but I do know that Mr Penman was having conversations with other uh, members of the board as well. So it's not that, uh, that his views weren't known. Uh, he rightly uh, made his views known to me and to others. Okay. Ben. Thank you, Convener. Mr Flanagan, uh, based on your opening statement, I have a, a, a number of, of queries. Like others have expressed, I welcome this, uh, the new presumption to, to meet in public and that papers will be published in advance and that uh, you're indeed uh, initiating steps for public participation. However, like others have expressed, I, I have a degree of scepticism given uh, what has happened previously. Uh, in light of that, in order to ensure that uh, the board and its committees will indeed meet in public, 
and that uh, the 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 ability, not the need, but the ability to hold some items in private can happen, but is not by any means uh, the, the norm, which it has been in the past. Can you detail any procedural changes that you will be undertaking in order to make sure that there is are proper checks and balances? For example, that decisions to meet in private will be made in public? Yes, I'm happy to make that, uh, that specific uh, uh, request. Uh, I'm happy to do that. Uh, you know, I, th I think we, we have got changes to processes going on. There is a, a, a much greater degree of examination about any request to have an item on an agenda that uh, is being requested for a private discussion rather than a public one. And I am very resistant uh, to things uh, going into uh, closed meetings. And in fact, the, the size of uh, closed meetings, the time, the length of them has reduced considerably over the past 12 months because I'm insisting on fewer and fewer items being in there. Uh, to, to give you an example, uh, we were, uh, had a request for the sale of a property in Edinburgh, in Cham Chambers Street, uh, that when uh, uh, bids were solicited, uh, there was a condition of confidentiality and uh, the, uh, the request came through to hold that uh, or make that decision in private session and I refused to do so because ultimately any sale of a property becomes a matter of public record on the, the land registry and therefore I insisted that they go back and get a release of the uh, confidentiality agreement and that the decision was then put through to a public board meeting. So that's one example of where I think the procedures have changed and we are pushing more and more into open uh, public meetings. So, so you've given an assurance today that, in, in the words of Moali, that re respectful open debate around whether items can be held in private will be encouraged going forward? Yes, I can give that undertaking. I think that happened in the past. I think we, we are uh, on a journey here and we are making sure that as much as possible can be uh, discussed and debated in public as possible. Did you want supplementary on that? It, it's just it's, it's yeah, specifically sure, on, sure. on that point because I'm a bit confused, Mr Flanagan, and I wonder if you could perhaps clarify. Was it under your leadership of the board that meetings were held in, in private? Who took the decision that the meetings would be held in private? Well, the only change that took place under my leadership was the proposal uh, in terms of the uh, committee meetings, which in the governance review uh, I liken to working uh, groups rather than yeah. committees. Yeah. And uh, that decision uh, or that recommendation to go to that was made public in my governance review mm -hmm. in March uh, last year. That was out in the public domain, that that was the proposal, and that was subsequently sub accepted by the Scottish Government. And we, but we only moved to do that actually in December of last year. So there have been actually very few meetings that have happened under the new arrangements compared to the old arrangements. Everything else, other than this move that I've been trying, and I was explaining to Mr McPherson, of trying to shift as much as possible into the public meet meetings has been an ongoing process since I started. But it was under your leadership that meetings were moved into private and you're now saying today that you don't think they should be held in private and that, that's why I'm confused. As I said uh, er in my earlier comments that uh, the governance review was written in uh, March last year and I think we have now moved to a situation which is a much better one uh, with the relationship with Police Scotland, and I don't think it's now necessary for that to happen. So c can you give a commitment today that every single meeting of the board, unless it is absolutely necessary, if, the, if something of a particularly sensitive nature is discussed, that every single meeting will be held in public? Yes, and I think that's what we've been striving to do. In so terms you're giving that commitment meeting. today? Yes, and, and uh, as, I've, as, as I've explained in response to Mr McPherson's uh, questions, we have been on a process here of pushing more and more into the public meetings. We're going to uh, discuss next week, at uh, next week's board meeting, in public, <coughs> that the committee meetings should uh, move to uh, public, as they were before. Uh, and that, uh, as I said in my opening statement, there would be an opportunity not just for public 
observation of these meetings, but actually participation mm. through uh, putting questions to us that they would like to see us ask in those meetings. And board members will be able to publicly um, dissent at board meetings? Yes. I, I, without I, giving prior notice? I, I think if, if something happens in the, uh, in, in the course of the, the meeting, that's of course that they're right. It's the right anyway. I have to, to accept that. That's specified in, uh, uh, on board. And you know, I, my experience is that it does happen from time to time. What I think any board member also needs to do, and me as chair, I, I have this responsibility as well, is to work as hard as we can to try to come to some consensus about any decision. Uh, now, if, if we can't reach that consensus and somebody has to dissent in public, that's perfectly OK. But through that consensus uh, approach, we should be able to understand uh, that uh, if, if, a, if a member wants to dissent in public, they're likely uh, to do it. And, and then I would be in a situation that I was prepared for that when the board meeting took place. Surely dissension is part of healthy discussion. Agreed. Ben. Thank you, convener. Also welcome in your opening statement was uh, your uh, assurance that you will consider any further recommendations on improving openness that come from the HMICS inspection due at the end of June. Do you have, in terms of time scales, any indication as to when you will receive those recommendations? My understanding uh, from the, uh, the terms of reference that uh, Mr Penman published that he's proposing uh, to issue his report, I think, on the 22nd of June, I think. I, I can confirm that, yes. The 22nd of June. <clears throat> Normally, we get a copy of his report a, a, a week or two beforehand just for fact, factual accuracy checks. So. Uh, mindful of a uh, parliamentary recess beginning in July, would you take an undertaking today to write to this committee at uh, the earliest possible opportunity uh, on receiving uh, those recommendations to provide your response to them in order that this committee can consider them before uh, the summer recess? I, 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 I can make that uh, commitment. I think w one of the things, and I'm, you know, because of my previous experience wasn't in policing and I'm not used to uh, until the past 18 months how uh, chief inspectors operate, uh, one of the things I, I would, uh, that's different about it compared to, say, audit reports, is that normally audit reports you're able to put your management response into the audit report and it's all published together. Uh, in chief uh, inspector, inspectors with constabulary, it seems to be a more sequential process that uh, they, uh, they publish their recommendations and then we respond to them. Uh, but I, I, I note the point about the dates here and the parliamentary recess and the fact that we will have a copy uh, in advance to check for factual accuracy, then I would undertake to try and as close to that date as possible uh, put out our uh, response to the recommendations that he's made. I'm grateful for that in advance. And, and lastly, convener, um, you raised the point in your opening statement around uh, appointing a, a, a vice chair, and, and, and that is welcome, and that the, the issues of gender balance could be uh, considered within that. The, uh, more holistically, in terms of the, the, the matter of gender balance, do you think there is more work that needs to be done in order to achieve a greater gender balance within the organisation? I, I think that's true of the SPA board, and I think it's true of policing in general. I think that's. Uh, and in many public boards, uh, there is an ongoing challenge in terms of uh, achieving that, uh, that, that balance that you're talking about. I, I would make the point for the record, I don't appoint board members to uh, the SPA board. That's a, that's a matter for the Cabinet Secretary. I participate in the process, uh, but I don't chair the panel that uh, does that. So I have, I, while I have some influence in terms of that, I don't, uh, I, I, I don't have um, sufficient influence to affect that in, in any way. I think the, um, the important thing to recognise is we have, as a board, we've moved to a, a, a more of a, a skills and experience uh, basis for selecting board members. Uh, and that's about the scale and complexity of the size of the organisation, uh, that we need people 
who have operated in those kind of organisations before. And I think the recent appointments that we've had uh, reflect that in terms of the, the skills, the, the background, the experience that uh, the new board members have. And we've shifted that uh, uh, to, uh, we now have of the 10 members, uh, seven are actually appointed within the last two years on that basis. But uh, we are looking at ways in which we can expand our reach. Uh, the last time round, uh, we used a number of uh, uh, networks, uh, both in terms of uh, diversity and, and ethnicity, to try to reach out uh, to that. But we are fishing in a pool that is relatively limited because of the scale of the organisation, and one where uh, people of that, you know, of whether it's uh, a gender issue or whether it's an ethnicity gender, they are very, very uh, in demand, if I can put it that way, and very selective about which uh, boards they will go on. Thank you. Thank you, Camille. John. Thank you very much. Um, I have a series of questions, but there was a, a very interesting point that came up, uh, Mr Flanagan, and it was in relation to when the discussion when um, um, Ms Mitchell was asking you about um, Mr Penman's letter and, and the, the, the flurry of activity around that time and you said that um, you returned to work on the day of the board meeting. Now I understand you have other duties. Is there no pre-meeting? Only on the uh, the morning of it and it's quite short. Uh, it's really just to A, update uh, the board on anything that has happened since the issuance of the papers and that's why Mr Penman's letter was on the list for us to uh, discuss and also to try and organise so that we will run the meeting and that we're not getting duplication of questions and things like that. Uh, there was a previous report from Mr Penman that was critical of the length of the board meetings themselves and we, we try to manage the timings a little bit more effectively than used to happen. Yeah, no, I, I've, I've no issue with the concept of pre-meetings. I'm trying to understand if it's, a, if, if it's an efficient overall operation, if you return to work on the day of a, a board meeting at the time when there is all that um, flurry of activity around the HMI's report? I, 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 I think it is. It's just, it's, uh, you know, the, the actual papers are, are worked on the previous week, so I'm kind of aware of what's in the papers and, and uh, really... I've, I've found no particular issue with that uh, uh, to date in terms of uh, having other activities the day or two before uh, an SPA board meeting. Okay, can I ask some questions about a couple of issues then, please? And that's around openness and transparency and relationships. Some of my colleagues have raised this issue because as parliamentarians, we are very, very keen that this building is seen as a public building and the public have access to the deliberations that take place here. There's very little takes place in, in private discussion. And um, can I ask about your relationship, for instance, with the Causal Scrutiny Board and the concerns expressed in, uh, in the public domain today about the late submission of papers, about the extent of papers? Because that's often a tactic used to frustrate open and transparent discussion and deliberations. Can you comment on that, please? Well, uh, this is one of the topics that will go to the board uh, next week. Uh, I, I noted the comments in the, the press this morning. Uh, we have had discussions, ongoing discussions with COSLA. Uh, we also have ongoing discussions with the individual local authority uh, scrutiny committees. So there's quite a, 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 a lot of dialogue in that regard. Uh, the um, COSLA have suggested the seven days because it's uh, consistent with the way that local authorities operate. Uh, our own view is that uh, we would like uh, members to at least have received the papers before they go to uh, COSLA, and we are dependent on getting the papers from Police Scotland. So we're, we're not entirely in control of that uh, timing, and we're trying to improve on that. Uh, what I wouldn't want to do is get papers issued too far in advance from the meeting so that things change in between the, uh, the, the paper uh, coming out and it then being considered at the board meeting. So, so that you are working with relatively compressed timetables. We had started to issue the, uh, the papers for the last couple of meetings 48 hours in advance and uh, generally speaking, the feedback that we got was that people were content uh, but that if we can do better, then we should do better, and I think that's what we will look to do. Chair, if you don't mind, um, to uh, 
give out further information uh, in relation to that, Mr Finney. I uh, attended the Causal Scrutiny uh, Conveners Committee uh, earlier in the year, I think it was January, uh, probably February actually, um, and it's fair to say I, I got a rough time uh, over uh, the uh, private uh, meeting situation. Uh, I then uh, made a point of uh, meeting with the chair, uh, then chair of the uh, Causal Scrutiny uh, Conveners uh, Committee, and we uh, discussed uh, the idea. Local elections, of course, were coming up, so, so people will change on the committee. But the idea was that we would uh, go further and look to the future uh, in taking the work plan. So regular meeting between myself, the chair of some of the conveners, uh, looking at what was coming forward in the year, giving uh, the uh, COSLA scrutiny conveners an opportunity to then perhaps inform, uh, shape uh, what papers might look like as we move forward. And we saw that as a positive thing, um, regardless of the private you know, closed session uh, type situation, which will be reversed. But that, that I thought was a good thing to do. Uh, that, that does sound very good and, and very reassuring. Uh, back to yourself, Mr. Flanagan, and if I can talk about the openness and transparency, you know, for instance, that papers are published for this meeting, and, and you'll be cited on the papers for, for this meeting, including, <coughs> excuse me, the letter from the uh, acting convener of the public audit to the cabinet secretary for justice. Um, are you able to comment on your relationship with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice as a result of that letter? I have not met formally with the Cabinet Secretary uh, since uh, the letter was published on um, Friday. Um, I have had a telephone conversation with him, uh, which we uh, were talking about other matters related to, to this. He noted the letter and the fact that he would have to respond to it uh, in public, and uh, I, accept, I accept that. But we haven't gone into the detail of the letter as yet. <coughs> okay. I, uh, can, can I just um, remind members and our witnesses that we are rapidly running out of time, so if you could keep your questions and your answers as, as short as possible, Certainly. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Yes, indeed. It's, it's, it's a very strongly worded letter, extremely critical of yourself and practices as it's seen. Um, I think there's a very interesting paragraph that's headed up, collective responsibility. Now, um, this, is part of a, th this committee is part of a process of which you're a significant part, COSLA and the local scrutiny committees. Can you really believe, if your board members see this letter, that they have confidence in you, Mr Flynn? Uh, my board members have uh, seen that letter, and the conversations that I related back to you earlier about their support for me were uh, had after they had seen that letter. Right. And, and how was that letter circulated, then? It was in fact, it was specifically said on the, uh, the letter, it was specifically requested that it was circulated, so it, that was actioned immediately, we received it. Uh, as, it as it actually would have been, as Mr Foley has touched on, there is a standard procedure, uh, which in the case of Mr Penman's letter uh, broke down, but actually, uh, normally, letters of that kind would be circulated to board members as a matter of course. Does the authority have a grievance procedure for dealing with complaints against officials, or, or indeed yourself? Uh, not a formal uh, one, and that's one of the reasons I think the, the role of a deputy chair would be quite important. What about the view that the suggestion by yourself at this stage that the, the deputy chair and your comments about danger, gender might be viewed as quite patronising and a, a belated response? No, I don't think it is. I think uh, you know there is a recommendation that all public bodies have 50-50 uh, gender by, that, by, yes. by 2020, and really I, I was only acknowledging that that is a good thing to do, and, uh, and I think uh, it, it's not patronising in the sense that if there was a, a chair who was female, then I think it would be a good idea that the deputy chair was uh, male, and to tr try and get that 50-50 split, not just as a board in total, but actually in uh, the chairing roles. And given your acknowledged treatment of Ms uh, um, Ali, do, do you think that that will have a, a negative impact on the potential to recruit females to the board? Well, there are a number of uh, 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 ladies already on the board. Uh, uh, two of them are chairs of committees. Uh, this is an issue that I've... No, I'm uh, talking about recruiting new members. Yes, and we have a new member and uh, uh, who, who's uh, female who has been involved in these discussions and uh, does not think that this would have had any impact on her application. And do you think it could potentially? No, I don't. And you don't think that any way presents as complacent, notwithstanding your changed position and your updated uh, 
You don't think you're complacent about this I, issue at all? I, I, I don't think I'm complacent. I think uh, the, the public appointments process is very thorough, very robust, uh, and it makes you work very hard on these issues. And uh, I think that the use, the last time round, we used, as I said, uh, a number of networks to try to reach out to people, and that was effective. And we uh, had a number of uh, female candidates uh, for the previous round uh, of, of applications. I just conclude with one comment, and, and this is a direct lift from the letter, and says, in particular, we consider that the chair of the SPA board, Mr Andrew Flanagan, would appear to have behaved inappropriately on occasion and in a manner not in keeping with the relevant Scottish government guidelines. We consider this to be unacceptable, particularly in relation to a public body that performs such a vital role. Do you agree with that? I, I, I think it the on, on occasion uh, it has to relate to uh, the matters we've been discussing today. Uh, the letter goes on to say that it should be taken up as a matter of my annual review, and I expect that to be uh, done by the Cabinet Secretary in due course. Thank you. Okay. Liam, I know you had a supplementary, but I'm going to bring Margaret in because she has a substantive question, and then I'll come back to you at the end. Okay. It was about the frequency of um, the board meetings, Mr Flanagan. There had been, um, I think, some criticism of there being only eight per year. Is there, um, only eight held in the year. Is there a move to have more board meetings? Well, we moved it from six to eight. Uh, in the early years, there used to... That, sorry, I should actually say that's that's a minimum number. We, we would have to have as many as are necessary for the business that's coming through. In uh, in the first year or two, I think there were more than eight. Uh, but the Do you have a, mo uh, a, a proposal to move it to 10 or even monthly board meetings? I'd, I'd, I'd be prepared to consider that. We're going to go through a further review of governance. Uh, 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 that's been, we've asked David Hume to take that on through the summer so that it's a, it's a fresh look compared to my own governance review. We'll also have the recommendations from HMI in terms of their current uh, work. Do you recognise the concerns um, expressed of the, over them only being eight? Why, a, a considerable time can elapse between meetings. Well, that, that's a, that is an issue, and as I said, uh, if business is uh, it, it's required for business purposes, we would institute more. I think eight, if I you know, based look in other uh, public bodies in Scotland, eight is already quite a lot. Uh, but you're right about the spacing of it, and I think we need to uh, to think about that. But as I said, eight is the uh, the standing minimum that's required, which is an increase from six previously. Uh, if we need 10 or we need 12... I uh, merely put it to you that you wanted to be on top of that and not on the back foot. Perhaps having more board meetings more regularly I, might allow you to do that. I, I, I think that's a good uh, suggestion, and I would certainly take that up with David Hume, who's going to conduct this review. And can I just ask you finally about um, the comments made by Brian Barber, who, became, who went public as soon as Moya Ali did, and um, shared his concerns about how SPA had operated, in particular with the appointment of SPA members, he thought this should be done by the Parliament, and I, I must admit that, um, and also that SPA should maybe report and be accountable directly to the Parliament, not just through this committee, but directly to the Parliament. And I must admit, I am concerned that seven out of your new members have been there two years, but only one was prepared to speak out about the governess. Could you comment on his suggestion? Um. Well, I, firstly, I should just say I, I've never worked with Mr. Barber. Uh, I understand I, I, that, but so, he's suggesting. Uh, so I, I don't know what happened before. I understand I, I, that I, I, too, to, but to, he's to So, um, you know, I, I, I read the comments uh, that he had made both to the press and to uh, the, uh, uh, the committee. Uh, I didn't recognise what he, what he was saying in terms of interference from government uh, or, or the like. Um, and it certainly hasn't happened in, in my time there. In terms of appointments to uh, uh, the, uh, the board, uh, I, I think we follow the normal public appointments process. Uh, if, if it's deemed by Parliament that you want more say in that, then I, th I, I that's think the main point was it's the, at present it's the public appointment process and then the Cabinet Secretary makes the the, the final decision. Now, if there's a situation where the government um, is, is seen to be interfering or um, a board member feels that and their appointment is um, in the gift of the Cabinet Secretary, then there could be a perception of conflict. So perhaps to be more open and transparent and to, to avoid any perception of that, if Parliament had uh, the final say, perhaps that would, would help. 
I have to say that's a matter for Parliament, uh, really, rather than for, for me. Yeah, I have no uh, concerns about it happening. Whether that's a formal part of the process or whether it's some sort of pre-scrutiny uh, through the committee's structure, I, you know, there are other models that work in other parliaments and, and those could be considered. Liam, final question. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Mr Flanagan, earlier in your statement you, you expressed a, a full and unreserved personal apology to, to Moe Ali and, and I think have also expressed regret and contrition about um, other events um, at the back end of, of, of last year. Um, uh, in the, in the um, press report in the Herald that John Finney referred to earlier uh, about the meeting with the COSLA um, scrutiny board, um, somebody who was at the meeting um, is quoted as saying, ultimately, in a telling comment, he, Mr Foley, uh, implied papers were not issued any earlier because of concern about leaks uh, to the media. You can imagine the reaction of disbelief in the room. Uh, would it be appropriate, Mr Foley, for you to apologise to the Cosla Scrutiny Board, or have you um, already issued such an apology? Uh, the my participation in, in the meeting uh, was uh, welcome, even if the uh, conversation uh, was difficult. Uh, the, the comment that you've referred to, uh, Mr MacArthur, uh, was set in a wider context. Uh, and the wider context was uh, me telling the, or advising uh, the causeless scrutiny uh, conveners uh, that one of the reasons, and it was only a reason, uh, for papers uh, not being issued seven days in advance was that in the past uh, that had proven difficult. So uh, when papers were late, there was a perception uh, that things were being held back, and that's not a good, a good position to be in. Uh, and also that it had resulted in a lot of the authorities' business being played out uh, in the media before the members had a chance to discuss matters. So it wasn't so much leaks, it was in the context of uh, the seven-day uh, publishing. Um, I think that we, we should publish uh, earlier than, than we currently are at the moment. Uh, I know that Mr Flanagan thinks uh, likewise, uh, but it would be a challenge to do seven days. Uh, I will be uh, going along to COSLA, uh, as I mentioned earlier, on a regular basis, because I think it's important to strike up this dialogue, uh, and we will take full on we will take fully on board uh, the COSLA uh, convener's views, which is why I said that, you know, I spoke to the chair of the committee and I, I offered up that we should meet regularly looking at the forward work plan so that the conveners themselves have got an opportunity to influence and have dialogue well in advance even of papers being produced. And I think that's a good way forward. That was very well received. Okay, thank you. As there are no further questions from the members, can I thank Mr Flanagan and Mr Foley for coming along today to give us their um, evidence. The next subcommittee meeting will be on Thursday the 1st of June, when we had intended to hold an evidence session on Durham Constabulary's counter-corruption report. However, Police Scotland has informed the subcommittee that the report will not be in the public domain prior to that date, and we will now hold an evidence session on either ISIX or Audit. And I now close the ninth meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on Policing in 2017. Thank you.